Welcome to Encounter the Word. We at the Jesuit Institute offer this reflection every Sunday on the Liturgy of the Word, where we try to make sure that our reflection on God's Word helps us live God's Word in our daily lives. And so, let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks that we can gather as a community, to reflect upon your word and how your word invites us to respond at this moment in our lives and the life of our community and our society. Help us through our listening to deepen our ability to hear what you want of us so that we might live this word in practical ways in the days that are to come. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. On the day of Pentecost, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said, People of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers and sisters, I may say to you confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne. He foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, you will show me the path of life. Lord, you will show me the path of life. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. O Lord, it is you who are my cup and portion, you yourself who secure my lot. Lord, you will show me the path of life. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel, who even at night directs my heart. I will keep the Lord before me always. With him at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Lord, you will show me the path of life. And so my heart rejoices, my soul is glad. Even my flesh shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to hell, nor let your Holy One see corruption. Lord, you will show me the path of life. You will show me the path of life and fullness of joy in your presence, at your right hand. Bliss forever. Lord, you will show me the path of life. 
A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Brothers and sisters, if you invoke as father him who judges each one impartially according to his deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, nor with the perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest at the end of time for your sake. Through him you have confidence in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Lord Jesus, open the scriptures to us. Make our hearts burn with love when you speak to us. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. That very day, the first day of the week, two of the disciples of Jesus were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is your conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some woman from our company, amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow to believe, all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he appeared to be going a little further. But they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, and he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together, and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them at the breaking of bread. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Emmaus story is one of the most well-known and well-loved of all the resurrection stories. Perhaps because it isn't only a story about what happened for the disciples in the aftermath of the death of Jesus. It's also a story that sheds so much light on the dynamic of our own spiritual experience and our own spiritual journeys. There are four parts to the story, spiritual desolation, spiritual accompaniment, spiritual consolation, and mission. First, spiritual desolation or darkness. The disciples have been through a devastating experience, both emotionally and spiritually. They've turned their backs on Jerusalem. They're walking away. Symbolically, Jerusalem was the place of encounter, and now they are walking away from what they've experienced. They're discouraged, disillusioned, disheartened. They're turned in on themselves. Their whole world has fallen apart, and they've lost not only their friend and their mentor in Jesus, but they've also lost the one that they thought would save them, the one that they had put their hope in. They are so distraught that they cannot recognize Jesus when he comes to walk with them. And instead of being amazed and encouraged by the woman's witness of the angels and the empty tomb, instead they are afraid and confused by that. The second part of the story is the experience of being spiritually accompanied. Jesus walks with Cleopas and the unnamed disciple on the road, patiently helping them to sift their experience and to begin to see it in a new way. The two pour out their hearts to Jesus and he listens to them talk about their sadness and their confusion and he helps them to look at their experience in the light of the scriptures. He challenges them too. In the message translation of the scripture, he says, you are so thick-headed and slow-hearted. He helps them to see their story differently. The third moment is an experience of spiritual consolation as Jesus comes in and stays and has supper with them. And he breaks and blesses the bread as he has done before, perhaps many, many times. But certainly we know at that last supper when he had told them to do this in memory of him. Their hearts burn within them. They recognize Jesus in the echoes of their previous experiences of him. And now there is a movement in them to greater faith, hope, and love. The fourth moment is mission, being sent out to witness and to share the gift. There's energy, joy, and new purpose. Their whole experience has been transformed. We hear that once they recognized that Jesus was risen, they didn't waste a moment. They turned around and immediately, even though it was heading for dark, went back to Jerusalem. I wonder, in which moment do you find yourself right now? Perhaps you are in a time of spiritual desolation. It might have been precipitated by a loss of some kind, a bereavement, a failure, perhaps a betrayal in a relationship. Maybe there's a sense of despair about the state of our country or the world, feeling weighed down by load shedding, the lack of water, worries about corruption or climate change. It may feel impossible to pray or to see where Jesus is in all of this mess. Your heart may feel cold. Perhaps you feel flattened, depressed. Maybe you're not sure what you are meant to be doing at the moment in the world. St. Ignatius of Loyola recognized that these states are part of all of our spiritual journeys. He has some helpful advice for us when we are in a time of spiritual desolation. He suggests that when we find ourselves in a space like this, when we are struggling and we can't connect with God, we need to remember that consolation will return. 
when we can't sense the presence of God, where it's hard to pray, not to panic, but just to keep very gently doing what we can. He also suggests that when we are in this kind of place, we should not go back on decisions that we previously made in a time when we did feel connected with God and when we could see clearly. If we think about that second movement of spiritual accompaniment, we also need to find someone to walk alongside us. We need to be heard, consoled, and sometimes challenged too. Perhaps you need Jesus to come and walk alongside you and to ask, why are you looking so downcast? What's preoccupying your thoughts? What's going on in your heart? Sometimes when we battle to see Jesus, he walks alongside us in the guise of a family member or a friend or a spiritual guide. When there is space to share our pain and to have light shed on it, the confusion and the darkness can begin to lift so that a sense of hope can begin to grow again. Then, like the disciples, we also experience Emmaus supper moments, moments of spiritual consolation, times when we feel Christ close to us and when there is a deep sense of peace and of joy, when he reminds us of who we most deeply are. For me, there is a beautiful church at the Bluff in Durban that looks out onto the sea where my own deepest moment of encounter with God happened, when I felt most loved and chosen. And when I go back, when I go back to that place, either physically or in my memory, it stirs within me again that deep love that I experienced. You will have your own sacred moments. These are moments to savor and to cherish, touchstone moments that we can go back to in the inevitable times of spiritual desolation. When we are in spiritual consolation, we need to remember that this is a grace that is given by God, not something we could make happen by our own efforts. And the experience of spiritual consolation then impels us like those disciples to want to share the news with others. It turns us around again. We, like those disciples, are enthused by a renewed passion and sense of purpose. Each of us will surely visit each of these moments of the journey many, many times along the way. And that's okay. It's all part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. But today, let's pray that we may more and more live with burning hearts and open eyes and with the desire to witness to the news that Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's join in praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and, and the glory are yours, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Let's pray, friends. Lord, we give you thanks that we could encounter your word, that we could reflect upon your word, and help us now to deepen our reflections as we try 
to live out the invitation that you have for each one of us. And in so doing, become your faithful disciples. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your, your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to have you reflecting with us again next week. Thank you.